Much wine had passed with grave discourse of who f**ks who and who does worse, when I, who still take care to see drunkenness relieved by lechery, went out into St. James's Park to cool my head and fire my heart. Those are the words of the Earl of Rochester, the notorious libertine, a writ that setting of one of his most memorable poems, a combination of scathing social satire and obscenity, it represents his wit and anger at their peak. But that isn't the whole story, not at all. Rochester first arrived at court in 1664, where he set about making a name for himself. His first action of note was to try and abduct his wife-to-be, Elizabeth Mallet, for which he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. He was released and then resumed his place at court, where he and his fellow aristocrats, known as the Ballers, proceeded to live life to the full. Scandalously. Of the building behind me is a banqueting house where Charles II entertained his favourites, including Rochester. Young men were expected to be witty, discreet, and to match the king drink for drink. Rochester delivered all three with flying colours. Rochester divided his time between his family in Oxfordshire and his court life in London. While he was at home, he tried to be a dutiful husband and father. But when he returned to London, all bets were off. The diarist John Evelyn said when he passed Brentford, the devil entered into him. There were many at court who literally believed him to be diabolically possessed. Rochester was nothing if not promiscuous. He boasted that he had swived more whores, more ways than Sodom's walls ever knew. And he eschewed the great ladies of court in favour of having sex with as many prostitutes as he possibly could. No wonder that he contracted syphilis at an early age, possibly as young as 13, and his health was never good throughout his life. But Rochester's flamboyant life at court was interrupted on a virtually annual basis. He was expelled for offences including giving the king a satirical lampoon, and most notoriously for destroying Charles's prized sundial with the words, what? Dost thou stand here to f time? It was after one of these offences that, fearing arrest, he fled to East London. Here, Rochester adopted the persona of an Italian doctor, Alexander Bendo, who specialised in cures for infertility. He managed to persuade his various clients' husbands that his intentions were pure by dressing up as Mrs Bendo as well. She was said to be a sober, matronly woman of grave appearance. Apparently, his treatment for infertility was not without success suggesting that his illegitimate children littered London for years afterwards. We might all be his sons and daughters. Now there's a thought. At last, the years of debauchery became too much for Rochester, and he succumbed to ill health brought on by syphilis in July 1680, at the age of 33. On his deathbed, he received various clergymen, all of whom were keen to see him convert back to Christianity. But he was so ill that it's still debated to this day whether any of it really happened but then Rochester always was a master of keeping people guessing, even after death. So there we have it. Lord Rochester, the terror of the ladies and their husbands, was also a brilliant poet. His work, A Satire Against Reason and Mankind, is one of the greatest philosophical attacks on humanity ever written. He's inspired everyone from Nick Cave to um, Barbara Cartland. He would have loved his posthumous fame as well as being amused by it.